Kilda, Kilda Koto. Ah, uh, Tina Koto Katoa. Uh, no, my hide in my picky my kiti nehui. Kilda, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight uh, to discuss this really important topic. Um, we'll begin formally soon, just giving some time uh, for people to come and join us. Uh, ko Marama Davidson aho, no te tai tokiro, me te tai rāwhiti, no ngā iwi o te rarawa, ngā puhi, me ngā tiparau. I'm Green Party co-leader and MP. I'm our spokesperson for children, ethnic communities, Māori development and Pacific peoples, among many other portfolios, a lot of other portfolios. Um, I'm a mum to our six tamariki. I live in Manurewa, where I'm broadcasting to everyone tonight, and I'm a very proud nana of our first beautiful mokopuna. And tonight I'll be co-hosting uh, with my fellow MP, the amazing Golrees Garaman. Golrees, could you turn your video on, please? Kia marama. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa paunamu te moana. Aroha atu, aroha mai. Tato ia, tato katoa. I'm Golrees Garaman, Green Party MP, first term MP, and um, wearing that um, unexpected title of being the first ever refugee MP um, in New Zealand. Um, so that is what I do bring to this conversation as well, and we'll get to that in a little bit. I'm spokesperson for corrections, courts, justice, human rights, police, and many others as um as Marama <laughs> is. Um, so we'll be talking with our amazing guest panelists about race-based discrimination at every single stage of the uh, criminal justice system here in Aotearoa. Um, but just a few housekeeping um, notes before Marama formally opens with the karakia. Um, so this evening we're using a Zoom webinar format. Um, so that means that you'll only be able to see us, the panelists, um, once we bring them on. Um, and you should feel free to fill out the poll if it's popping up on your screen to tell us um, where you're from, that will be fun. Uh, the chat function is set up so you can message me or the other panelists and you should feel free um, to send us um, uh, questions or queries or discussion points and we'll get to some of those hopefully um, by the end. Um, the chat function is just at the bottom in the middle um, of your screen. Uh, we're also live streaming to Facebook and I understand the link to that is going to be posted in the chat or is posted in the chat. Um, and you'll see some other polls just popping up. Just feel free to either fill them out um, or if you don't want to close them. Marama, over to you. Kia ora, Me karakia tato. Uh, kia tau te rangi Māori, o te rangi e tū nei, o papatua nuku e tākotu nei, o te taeo e awhi nei ki runga i a tātou. Ti hei, mūri ora. May the peace of the sky above, of the earth below, and the world all around rest upon us. Kia ora tātou. Uh, so I want to start... Um, by acknowledging first and foremost that we are standing uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement and with black communities, uh, with everything that is happening and has happened to black and brown communities in the United States, with the people who have had to go through a justice system that does discriminate, that does dehumanize, and that certainly has traumatized uh, we are standing with uh, black communities and Nifano, who also bear the brunt of that discrimination. And to the Black Lives Matter movement, to advocates here and organizations around the world, you are doing incredible and important work as you highlight what is wrong and what is unjust. Uh, we stand absolutely, first and foremost, with the Black Lives Matter movement for the community and black communities and black families in and of themselves. And it has resonance here in Aotearoa and inspiration for us here in Aotearoa with the 
with the struggles that we are also trying to address. Uh, yesterday, with the police announcing an end to the arms response teams, shows what the grassroots movements can achieve when we speak out together, when we work together to ensure uh, better protected communities. Uh, so that you're aware of what's happening tonight on this webinar, on this corridor, uh, Goris and I will uh, shortly give a brief update on what the Greens are working on in government and what we think needs to change. And then what I'm most excited about is we'll be hearing from each of our incredible panelists, their organization, their mahi, how they see the world, all the broader issues we are facing and the key things um, that they would like to speak with us about what needs to change. Golrez and I will do a bit of a free flow discussion with our panelists on both the Black Lives Matter movement and the issues that resonate here in Aotearoa and what our own struggles are as well. And then we'll be answering some of your questions. Uh, towards the end, we will spend some time thinking about what is next, um, what needs to continue to ensure that we are all free of discrimination when encountering the justice system, how we can affect change and where that change needs to happen so we have uh, healthy and thriving communities everywhere for everyone. Ah, so speaking of communities, let me just check uh, if I can see that we have got um, some results of the polls of where people are tuning in from. A massive crowd from Auckland, kia ora, our fellow, our Tamaki Makaurau people, Northland and Auckland, right through, through Waikato, Taranaki, down to Wellington, across across to our um, other islands, uh, right from Nelson, down into Canterbury, Kia ora, Otago, uh, Southland, and some people tuning in from overseas as well. And wow, this is awesome. We've also found out that 70% of you, um, this is your first time joining a virtual town hall uh, with, the, with the Green Party. So no mai, um, picky mai, welcome everybody to our corridor tonight. Uh, so just a little bit more about, well, me as a, as a wahine Māori tangata whenua politician. Um, I am really privileged uh, to, to have been inspired right back six years ago, I believe, when Trayvon um, was murdered and the sort of starting point of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it was something that I, it's a movement that I have stood with before I became an MP and will continue to stand um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. The systemic racism uh, from the founding of that country, from its slavery beginnings, its genocide of its first peoples, its stealing of land to uh, funnel the wealth into the hands of a few, um, it's white supremacist beginnings, uh, it's exploitation of people and the land to build up that wealth and that power um, to be held and to uphold a status quo of that wealth and that power staying in the hands of a few. Um, is something that resonates very strongly here as well with our colonial beginnings, um, our land, our language, uh, being taken from us and the struggles and the work to overcome um, and remain staunch and proud of who we are has massive resonating here. And in fa actual fact, I can even go back, we can even go back to the 60s where the um, sort of black freedom movements in the 60s happening in the United States uh, inspired our young Maori um, disaffected activists here and my own parents were part of our Ngātama Toa um, back in the 70s who had looked in, at what was happening and standing up speaking out on injustice and a lot of that resonated um, with our activists in that, in that era as well. Uh, so I have a, a, a many levels of um, connection with those movements and as a politician, I, I am a co-leader of the Green Party and I'm really proud that we were the only political party to stand strong from the very start to speak out against further arming of police 
when you have a police a system that is discriminatory that has systemic racism the last thing you want is to give that system more guns um, we know what does make communities safe and it is not adding more guns. And so I'm really proud that the Green Party right from the get go supported and brought the voices of those grassroots communities in resisting those armed response teams into parliament and used our uh, influence and our political power however we could. And we saw how that was successful. We've got a lot more work to do to end that systemic racism, but we've shown that with grassroots and people power, um, we can work together and get the results. Um, I also do acknowledge uh, Labour's Māori caucus who also came on and supported the end of the armed response teams. Uh, and, that's, and that's a solidarity with understanding that Māori have long, Māori Pacific, people of colour, low income communities, um, refugees, migrant communities, brown communities have long been at the helm of that discrimination. Uh, so, um, and very, you know, and I'll, I'll hand that over, I'll hand over to Golries for her experiences and her grounding, but I just want to acknowledge um, my responsibility as a politician and um, as a wahine Māori politician is to never forget um, that my whanau, my parents, my brother, um, who has continued all his life to be stopped while driving while brown. My parents, um, who uh, we have a legacy of my brother and I being really young when we witnessed our parents being beaten by police um, and the channels that they tried to go through to get some justice from that. So I have a responsibility to, to never stop working with people power, people voices, grassroots organizations to change, to remove the system, to remove the racist system, and to build up the community-led systems that we need to truly make our communities safer. So kia ora koutou. And with that, I now pass it over to you, Goris. Kia ora marama. Um, I wanted to start as well by um, giving a mihi to the Black Lives Matters movement and um, just acknowledging the incredible pain um, that, that it is to live in a system where you can walk out the door and be literally blown away um, by military style guns on a racist police force after generations of also having that degradation um, built into every system. Um, so, Mihi to them and also to all of the organizations here who came together, rose up the voices and the experiences here that do link in with that same system of white supremacy. And we got to stop the police being armed because we know and research shows, and it's not up for debate, that that racism exists here in our justice system at every level. Um, and I, I just want to hold as well, and I, the reason I do bring um, my own background to this conversation um, is that it's so close to my heart in terms of reform for that system and actually um, we need to rip it apart. <laughs> but I want to hold that when people from my background, when migrants and refugees speak about race and discrimination here, we're often told that we're not Kiwi enough to do that. We should just go home to where we came from. Um, and I do want to say that actually patriotism, a love for this country means wanting the best um, for her. And I kind of hold um, Dr. Cornell West's words um, that said that justice is what love looks like in public. So we are fighting for that justice, um, both, both, you know, um, symbolically and literally in the justice system. Uh, the other thing that I really want us to hold is the other, uh, the other thing that gets thrown at us and got thrown at all of us who stood up against um, the armed response trials um, is that you know this is uh, this is all for, for community safety and and it's to stop gang violence and it's to stop gun violence and what we need to hold right now as a nation um, is the very recent memory and heartache of the 
biggest act of gun violence that our country has ever seen, uh, one of the worst acts of race-based terror in our history, um, at least in very recent living memory, um, because of course, as Mata Mura said, we have lived um, in this nation with um, race-based violence and mass murder um, before, but we had this happen just over a year ago, 51 people lost their lives in the Christchurch terror attack. Um, and not only was that um, based on white supremacy, but we know that, that the terrorist wasn't stopped. He wasn't being monitored, despite having um, had reports about, um, about his behavior or, or the behavior of people at his gun club, um, despite um, him, uh, collecting military style um, firearms, despite that community, the victim community, um, the Muslim community across the nation reporting hate crimes and hate speech for years. None of it was being monitored because white supremacy wasn't seen as a threat and the cops were in fact monitoring that victim community. They were mo they've monitored, they've searched, they've um, They've done all, all sorts of dawn raids, haven't they? Um, on uh, Māori communities, on brown communities, on Muslim communities. Um, and so that system is not there to protect us unless we, we demand that. Um, so it is scary when that same system that's there to target us is now armed. We do have to stay vigilant. Um, most of my adult life, um, my work was in the criminal justice system, and that was because I wanted to be a human rights lawyer. And criminal justice is one of the purest forms of human rights law that you can practice in our system. Because every day you are standing up to the powers that be in, in the justice system that you're trying to make more transparent, you're standing up against unlawful search, unlawful uses of police power, of the court's own power, you're uh, pointing out discrimination um, across communities, across cross sections of marginalization, whether that's mental health sufferers, whether that's the disabled community, um, 90% of our young people that come through the justice system uh, suffer from what's described as extreme learning disabilities. Um, and it is Māori and it is Pacifica communities, it's the poor. So that's what you deal with in the justice system and it just blows my mind that anyone would dispute that that system is broken and it's prejudiced and it's racist. Um, so that's what we're standing up against and we've got a lot more work to do. We will get to that later, but I mean, it, it's, it's recognizing that if education is the problem, then actually investing in inclusive education might help get some of those young people out of the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. It might be mental health care that we need to invest in. Actual health care, our hospitals were rotting because of successive governments defunding public services. Um, and it's about having all of those services be provided in a culturally appropriate way. Because if we're gonna honor Te Tiriti o Waitangi, we've got to recognize that the Māori text is true. Sovereignty was never ceded and Māori need to lead in the solutions for their community. So I think that's enough from me. Um, <laughs> kia ora and back to you, Marama. Kia ora, Goris. Uh... Everything that you spoke through and and everything that tonight is about um, has just got me feeling really connected to this to this corridor to this topic. So um, I I've been a lot. I'm a public speaker. I do I speak every day, but I am I am shaking. <laughs> I'm shaking right now because this is I don't know. This is real stuff. This is close stuff. So with that. I would like to uh, now bring on our panelists in and we'll ask each of you to introduce yourself and your world. Um, as soon as you come in, share with us some of the th key things you think need to change. And firstly, um, an amazing voice for wahine Māori, for Māori, for whānau and for the world, um, an amazing advocate and creative um, who has a fucker papa of brilliance? Can I please bring you on Awatia Mita? No, my Haere mai, Kōrero mai. Ngā mihi, 
ki a koutou mō tō pōwhiri uh, ki a hau, uh, ki te kōrero mō kaupapa nei. Um, no mai ki ngā kai i mā takitaki, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Yeah, um, as Marama said, my name is Awatea Mita. Um, I study criminology at Te Heringa Waka here in Wellington. I work for um, restorative justice, which is an alternative way to address harm. It's a process that uh, provides a safe environment for people who have experienced harm and who have caused harm to come together and have a conversation that hopefully will restore some balance and with the aim to provide a pathway to peace um, for all parties concerned. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to Marama and Golras for holding this discussion because it needs to be a nationwide discussion and it's really reassuring to know that at least one political party is willing to take the lead and foster this conversation. And I want to raise this point because we have another political party running around Parliament with a MAGA hat glorifying US politics and I don't think that's helpful. While we want to action the principles of Black Lives Matter, and that's essential, uh, we don't need to inherit the US way of doing politics. And um, I have two Maori African American nephews who are also Muslim who live in the US. And I worry about them every day because of the police brutality. And the sad thing is that they will still be at risk here in Aotearoa, New Zealand from mistreatment by law enforcement. I also have a brother here in Aotearoa, New Zealand who has experienced brutality for most of his life. And I wanna to say to everyone out there, if you have experienced brutality at the hands of the police, that your voices are being heard, that you have a right to change and to heal. And so while we don't want to inherit US uh, way of doing politics, that is because here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have a tikanga, we have mana motuhake, we have tino rangatiratanga. These need to be recognized and protected because they contain the values of equality, fairness and aroha to drive us towards more equitable, equitable outcomes for all people not outcomes that just prefer the wealthy or uh, prefers one ethnicity over another, but equitable outcomes for everyone. And so from this conversation, I hope that um, we will be driven towards those values and um, how we can take action to ensure that we have these equitable outcomes. Kia ora. Kia ora Aotea. Um, thank you for grounding us so quickly in the values for the Aotearoa that we can work together towards an Aotearoa that really does value compassion and manaki for all of us rather than some of us. Um, an Aotearoa that really does understand we don't all feel safe um, in our communities. We've, we don't all feel free of being targeted and discriminated against. Nga mihi nui kia, kia koe e hoa. Uh, back to you now, Gauris. Kia ora. Um, next, we have Sonia Renee Taylor. She's the founder and radical executive officer of The Body is Not an Apology. She is also an author, a poet, a spoken word artist, a speaker, a humanitarian, a social justice activist, and an educator which I do, I do admire so much because your organization is all focused on that um, in every level, whether it's the poetry, whether it's, um, whether it's uh, being um, the radical executive officer of the body as not an apology, you are an educator. So over to you. Kia ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, no Oakland, California, ho. Uh, kia taranaki toku kainga inayane uh, uh, ko Taylor uh, faun, toku fano uh, ko Sanya toku ingoa uh, norero tenakoto tenakoto tenatato katoa. Um, 
thank you all so much for having me today. Uh, it's an honor to get an opportunity to be here and be in conversation um, about this important um, historical moment and this important, I don't even think it's just a historical important, uh, like an important historical moment. I believe that it is, it is an important um, energetic and spiritual moment for the world um, that we are being asked collectively to reckon with a history that has been so profoundly harmful. And I think that the reason that we see what is happening in the US spread globally, the reason why there were 10,000 people in Aotearoa with their feet on the ground marching around this issue is because it isn't just a US issue. Because while the specific nature of sort of egregious violence that we see in the US might be specific to the way that the US does violence, uh, the US certainly is not um, specific in violence. Mm -hmm. And that uh, white supremacist violence is a global issue. That white supremacy is a global issue. Um, that the structures and systems of uh, colonization the entire world has felt the impact of that. And black and brown and indigenous people are across the planet in this moment are saying, this is no longer how we are willing to live. This is no longer what we're willing to accept. Um, and I think that that is the collective moment that we find ourselves in. Um, at the body is not an apology. Um, our work is really specifically about exploring this intersection between identity and the physical beings that we live in um, and social justice. And so, again, when I have this conversation that is about what is the spiritual reality of this moment, what, I, what I'm also saying is that white supremacy and white supremacist violence, which is the structure that policing lives under. Um, and, and I think that we need to be clear about that, that um, the first um, instances of policing in the world were slave patrols out of the US, based very specifically created to capture the property of human bodies. And so for the purpose of profit and power, right? And so I think we have to be honest about what it is we're talking about. Yes, that's the form that that takes, but the overarching system is like I said, white supremacist violence. And white supremacist violence isn't just about the system. It is absolutely the system, but the system is not some invisible fog that attacks the world. The system is human beings choosing to be engaged in policy and activities and beliefs and ideas and organizations that reaffirm the beliefs and um, actions of a white supremacist violence, right? And so we don't own, we need to do two things at the same time in this moment, which is target the systems that are not working, that are causing violence and target the way the system lives inside of us. Because if we do not extract the system inside of us, we will not have the tools to build a new system externally. And that to me feels like one of the moments that we are really um, being given an opportunity to, to reckon with in, in, this, um, in this particular time. I think the last thing I wanna say is, I want us to be courageous in our imagination right now. We are at a, we are at a a moment where the entire world is cap is held captive in the intensity of this of this you know season don't think small think enormous think liberatory imagination think what does a world without police look like mm -hmm. because i'm interested in a world without police what, um as um, Awatia said, we have the resources, the understanding, the knowledge within our own communities to govern and keep our communities safe. So why do we need them? And what would we do with the money if we took it from them and put it back into communities? It's the time to be bold. I think we have the opportunity to be bold and brilliant and really engaged in a liberatory imagination in this moment. And I hope that we'll seize it. Kia ora. Um, that's incredibly inspirational and I think um, 
for me as well, it, it, it touches on a few things because I think um, for some of us who've moved into a um, very direct uh, sort of system of white supremacy as migrants, there is a moment where you consciously realize that race exists and you're, and you're in it. <laughs> and that, that's, you know, it, it hurts to kind of be awake when the knife goes in, so to speak. Mm. But I, you know, but we also have that privilege of not having necessarily had the generational sense of inferiority. But I always wish that we also confronted our own, as you've said, you know, we participate, you know, we each as individuals participate in the system of white supremacy by choosing um, not to break it down as well. Exactly. And so I do, I do wish um, that we take heed and we take this moment as communities of color and talk to each other and back each other. And we did see that after the Christchurch mosque terror attack, when it was Tangata Whenua who stood up and said, um, yeah, this is us. <laughs> you know, right. when there was that one moment <laughs> where we all thought, oh, are we just gonna absolve the status mm -hmm. quo? And, and the yeah. migrant communities, the refugee communities, the Muslim communities didn't necessarily have um, the bandwidth to do that alone. And to kind of go, no, we need to tear this down. But I wish we had talked to each other more. And I, I hope we keep kind of weaving that into, into the fabric of our society, as you say, just both in tearing down the system and tearing down our own individual participatory um, culpability in it. Yeah. 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 So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, my colleague and friend, Golris. Thank you. Awatia, thank you, Sonia. Um, this discussion is um, so important to me um, as a human being, um, and I'm really, really privileged to be here and be a part of it. Um, for our for our people who are watching with us and are joined uh, joining us tonight, just a little bit of housekeeping to keep our flow and to let people know. Um, some others may have just tuned in now, so a reminder. We are also streaming this live on Facebook right now. Um, I believe on the Green Party, I believe on uh, my Marama Davidson MP Facebook, I think Golris Garaman MP Facebook pages as well. The link is in the Zoom chat um, that you've got there and in the Facebook event. And of course, you're welcome to share that link out with anyone else who you think might be interested. Um, I, I'm certainly a bit, a bit chuffed to be having this night here with these amazing women. Uh, also, some of you have already been sending through questions via the chat box, some brilliant questions in Zoom and on Facebook. And we'll do our best uh, to get to these shortly because they're really good questions. So I, I do actually want to honor um, at least a few of those questions. But for now, a little, a little bit more free flow discussion. Um, Sonia, I, I was writing notes. <laughs> Being courageous in our imagination, think enormous. Uh, <laughs> Sonia and Awatia, I'll come to you first, Sonia. Why have we not been courageous in our imagination as a, as a mm. global community, as, as a country in our neighborhoods? Um, what has been the barrier to us uh, maintaining the status quo? Um, mm. What has kept us um, uh, separated? And what have been some of the, and you can go anywhere with us, what have been some of the barriers why we haven't stepped outside and, and been courageous um, enough yet? Go ahead, Sonia. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that we, the system, you know, that, that big messy thing that we talk about <laughs> is designed to make you not courageous, right? It's designed to keep you small. And part of the reason that it keeps you small is because it keeps you under its power. Power, privilege, resource are things that matter very specifically in the context of the ways in which we define ourselves, right? And so, and again, this is why I talk about, we can't talk about the political issue without talking about the internal issues that we are grappling with because they feed the way in which the politic happens. Um, and if we are dealing and operating in the world from a place in which we inherently do not feel enough, right? White supremacist violence, what the notion of white supremacy, and when I talk about white supremacy, I'm not merely talking about a shooter who walks into a mosque and 
and murders 51 people. I'm talking about the everyday institutions. I'm talking about the idea that, you know, in a nation uh, uh, with Tonga Tafinua, there are governing boards where there are no Maori bodies on it. And that there are people who actively protest to keep that from happening, right? The fact that, um, that you know, that it, in the process of reparations, um, Maori folks received back one cent of what it was economically that was taken from them. All of those things are white supremacist violence. Uh, and so the, the foundation of white supremacist violence, I believe at its core is about a collective sense of not enoughness. And so if I am not internally enough, then the only way in which I get to define myself is by that which I can take and power over um, and dominate in the external world. That is how we define. And so, and then everyone is struggling to situate themselves in this hierarchy of, of, of identity based off of these externalized systems of enoughness. And that's what keeps people from, from challenging it is because we're convinced that here's the top of the hierarchy. I'm trying to figure out where I fall in the middle of that. Either I'm at the bottom or I'm somewhere scrambling to get to the middle. Um, but I'm also conditioned to believe that whatever is at the top is supposed to be at the top and that I'm not actually supposed to be, that, that the system of hierarchy is real at all, that there is some external thing that will make me enough. And if we actually all divested collectively from the idea that there's some externalized way to be enough, then all the systems that we built around enoughness will start to crumble. I deeply believe that. Um, and so the courageousness is about divesting from that system of hierarchy. And as each of us divest from it, we, we, we disrupt the foundation of it. And I think that that's where new things become possible. Kia ora, Sonia, ngamahi. Awatea, did you want to have a go at that as well? Barriers. Yeah, I wanted to approach it from a personal experience um, with our family. So a lot of the police violence that we experienced was actually in, uh, it was a direct state response to our activism. And so mm. in that time, our voices, when we tried to speak out about this violence, were silenced. We were told we were liars, we were exaggerating, um, that these things never happened when we tried to address it at the time. And so part of being courageous for our whānau was 30 years later, sitting down and having a conversation about that violence, that state violence, police brutality that we experienced. We hadn't spoken about it for 30 years. Mm. And that was because one, you know, it was so traumatizing, and two, because we had been taught to press it down and not talk about it because you just opened yourself up to more attack. At that time, it wasn't just our whānau going through that. Um, in the process of having our conversations with one another, we found out that the same thing had happened to other um, Māori and Pacific Island whānau um, that... Uh, it, effectively, the activism movement was squashed and people were in prison, worried about their partners at home. Uh, people had been evicted from their houses because they were activists. There were all kinds of things going on for everybody. And so we also only had uh, like a single narrative coming through about uh, Black, Indigenous and people of colour, um, that, that they are the inferior people um, and you know, white supremacy was still flourishing then and still being able to control this narrative about who we were and defining who we were. And now what, what part of what's changed, uh, I guess in the indigenous experience um, early on, it was, just, was our stories were about our struggles and then they were about um, defining who we were until we get to a space where we've been able to um, tell our stories, uh, you know, for, for the benefit of being able to express ourselves. And so now with uh, communication and global communications, with people, you know, and there's a fucker puppet to this that goes way back, ha have been able to, um, uh, you know, take apart these embedded practices of um, imperialism and colonialism and identify you know, how this process of colonization for us as Māori has occurred, where, what the roots of that was, and then being able to 
come back and discover our own roots after our culture had been legislated into what they hoped would be extinction. And now we get to um, connect with other um, Black and Indigenous and people of colour around the world. We get to take back the narr narrative and um, tell our stories again. And I think while those um, barriers are there, we also have a history of resistance and, and we're still here and we're still fighting. And um, I, I, the momentum is swinging. You know, so I'm a hopeful person. Kilda. The outcome mm. we're gonna get, yeah. Thank you uh, both and Awatea for bringing us through the barriers and moving us through to our celebrating our resistance and our strength and how we overcome the barriers and will keep overcoming the barriers. <laughs> One of the most important parts about our discussion tonight. So thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm really excited. Now we're going to get into some of the questions. Um, I'll ask a question first to both of you. Goalies has got another one to follow. I'm pleased uh, about this question uh, uh, that has come through from Kay. <laughs> uh, if I could come to you first, Sonia, um, from Kay. Uh, she hopes the speakers touch on impacts on children growing up with racist profiling and how people can help them overcome trauma and internalized oppression, whether in New Zealand or in USA. And um, she remarks, police shouldn't point guns at children. So Sonia, please go ahead, trauma and healing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would just start by saying police shouldn't point guns at anyone. Police probably don't need guns. <laughs> I'll start there. <laughs> police don't need guns. And that's not even a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm presenced right now to um, the work of um, a, a researcher, a sociologist in the United States, uh, Dr. Joy DeGreer, um, uh, who has done a lot of studying around the impacts very specifically on, on black folks and the history of white supremacist violence on their lives. And um, she put forth a framework that she calls post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, and it really is about the, the constant historical epigenetic um, impact of racialized violence over generations, right? Um, and I think that the beginning part of really interrupting that for young people is first acknowledging it. I think that there's a way in which we're like, if we shield children from, you know, like if we tell kids that this isn't happening, then somehow they'll be magically you know, put in a bubble where, where they're not impacted by it. And I think that children are brilliant, smart beings and they know what's happening. And rather than gaslighting them and pretending like what's happening isn't happening, we need to actually have a conversation with kids about what structural racism looks like, about the fact that we are living in a situation where these things are happening. So that one, they don't internalize the message of the experience that's happening to them. Like, oh, there's something wrong with me. No, there is something wrong with this system that we're in. There's something wrong with the messages that we've given people. But we don't, you don't have to take that on. You don't have to hold that inside yourself. I see it. I know it's happening. I want you to know that I see it. And I want you to know that together we are powerful enough to combat it. And then helping kids understand activism from a young age, giving them an opportunity to be in their power so that when these things happen, they have a context for it and they have a sense of efficacy and autonomy around battling it. Beautiful, Sonia. Kia ora, awatea. Uh, yeah, I, I was thinking about the question that it, it came back to our family, our whanau experience, and that um, we didn't have those conversations when we um, were children. I mean, um, it's hard. Your, your mother's being strip searched, your brother's being beaten by the police, and, and you don't know what's happening. And we didn't get to have those conversations then. We did have them 30 years on. And I'm so grateful for that. It's made a huge change to our lives. So I can kind of you know, testify to the effectiveness of having these conversations um, with our young people. And um, I, I definitely want to uh, you know, support what Tonya was saying about we, we unfortunately, you know, we do have to have these conversations now um, in the you know, current climate that we live in. And it's not just for our young people, you know, the uh, Ministry of Education did a report about 
they're um, more likely to experience racial discrimination from their teachers and uh, bullying from other students. So when our young people, like what they are doing at Marist now, are calling out racism um, in their stance for uh, BLM, our young people need to know that if they're going to do that, that we're there and that we support them and that we encourage them. And if they're experiencing that type of racism from a teacher at school or, um, you know, in any wet practice, you can go practically anywhere and um, have these experiences pop up that um, we support them and, and yeah, reinforce mes messaging to them that, um, you know, they are, you know, amazing. Um, they're loved and that they're not the sum of other people's kind of insecurities about their identity. You know, that, that they have their unique culture is a gift to the world and their, that uniqueness is a gift for us, you know, for us all. So, um, yeah, I really can't stress enough I, how important I think it is to have these conversations and to be, you know, their encouragers and to praise them. Um, and so that they know that when they make a stand, we have their back. Just as you were talking, Awatea, about uplifting our young people, grounding the pride in who they are and where they come from, I felt my brain's uh, chemicals firing and tingling. I think we all need that as humans, let alone our developing brains of our younger people. So, like, if you want the science, I felt it just then. <laughs> I felt it just then. Um, Goris, you have a question for our panelists. Yeah, I do. But I also just wanted to um, really emphasize this idea that we're being gaslit um, or, you know, and I don't know how many people actually use that term, but it okay. kind of comes from the power and abuse relationships, right? Where somebody pretends that the reality of another person's experience, whether it's a battered woman or um, another kind of abusive relationship isn't happening. And that is definitely what it feels like when you're part of a marginalized group, a race group or women um, or, or whoever else is experiencing institutional prejudice. And the status quo just gets to say, oh no, you just didn't get the promotion. Oh, he wasn't following you around the shop. You know, you weren't, yeah. And it's that. And I've just been obsessively, Marama knows this, um, reading um, the poetry of my icon, her good friend, Carlo Mila. And I was just reading Eating Dark Chocolate While Watching Poor Holmes Apology. Mm -hmm. And it's about, that, that, that moment where Paul Holmes, the father of a nation, called Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, a cheeky darky. And it's the microaggressions throughout her life that come back to her from being a six-year-old, being a teenager, being all the little things that somebody will say that's like calling someone a cheeky darky, that everybody went, oh, you know, oh, who cares? Oh, it's just a joke. Get over it. But for us, and when you look at young children, it's heavy. It's every day. And in the US, there's research now that shows the microaggressions that people of color in the US suffer. And that's, it's everything from like, oh, can I touch your hair? Oh, isn't that weird? And it's like, you're excluded from beauty standards. It's mm -hmm. everything from, you know, um, the education system. It's everything from walking into a shop and someone is following you. That stress is measurable uh, at the same level as soldiers living in combat zones. Hmm. That's what people yep. are living with. And so it is gaslighting not to acknowledge it. And I think Pakia here as well, you know, asked, you know, what can I do? And one of the first things is make space and listen to the experiences of marginalized communities and of Māori, mostly here. It's about Māori, <laughs> you know, it's that mm -hmm. generational um, uh, degradation and suffering. Anyway, to the question. Sorry. Um, this is to um, Aotea, um, and it's um, what are the main obstacles to restorative justice versus punitive justice uh, in New Zealand, and what can we as uh, systems do practically to help uh, migrate our justice system to that approach? Is, is, was that clear? I was a bit shaky. Um, I, I think the question was about what are the main um, obstacles to restorative justice becoming more mainstream? Kind of yeah, so what are, what are the main obstacles to restorative justice? Um, it says versus punitive justice. 
but I yeah I think essentially it's um it's about what are the, what are the um, obstacles to restorative justice being mainstreamed in New Zealand. I hope I've got that right. Yeah, and some um, there's like I think there's a, a number of obstacles um, against restorative justice. So a lot of the great work that is getting done is despite these barriers um, being there, and because we have such committed you know people involved. Um, who do things um, that are outside of their pay grade. And that, that's how, that's the unfortunate reality of how things are getting done is because people have a commitment to that kaupapa. Um, I think that it's really difficult time right now um, after COVID. There are a lot of changes um, taking place in that space. So it's very challenging. Um, in terms of some of the barriers, I, I guess, um, yeah, it's kind of difficult to comment on now because the landscape's changed so much thanks to COVID. We're, we're right in the middle of um, a contracting phase and that had to be reorganized now. Um, and yeah, it's left the, um, there's a, a bit of uncertainty out there that uh, where things are becoming clearer every day. And I think that's partly because of COVID. Um, but some of this, some of the um, barriers are about having um, support for the program, um, people's attitude that it's a soft option. Uh, and some of, sometimes that comes from people who have never actually even been involved in a restorative justice conference. Um, and, but uh, yeah, and I also wanna focus on the, the, the other things that are happening in terms of the uptake of restorative justice, where we have schools that have restorative practice that are being able to bring down um, the suspensions of their students by um, using restorative justice practices in their school. And that um, is providing um, uh, the, um, oh, the pathway to, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, sorry, disrupting that school to prison pipeline um, when we're able to have um, restorative practices in schools. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, sometimes it's treated as something that's only about sorting out things between students and not between students and teachers or between. Mm. So there's still um, maybe an idea in some circles that restorative justice is something that you do to people uh, and not necessarily with people. Um, and that's uh, a big difference. Um, the reason I think why um, punitive justice is so embedded in our laws and legislation right now. And I think that there has been a lack of courage in changing um, some of these laws. And this goes right back to like the tough on crime referendum. And we had the um, Bail Amendment Act and the Parole Act and all, and all these types of things, um, our, three, our own version of three strikes law. And um, we only have restorative justice in the pre-sentencing space. So even if people over time have a change of heart and want to participate in a restorative justice conference after sentencing, uh, there's no funding available to do that. And there hasn't been um, the political will yet um, to change that. So um, yeah, I'll just leave it there on that topic. Gilda, um, I have got a really awesome question that came through from Tim Hodgson, and I want to frame it in a way that help, it's it's going to follow on from exactly what you've just talked about, Awatea, in terms of restorative justice, but it's also going to move us into some of the practical work that we can all be working together for, and both yourself and, uh, and Sonia can sort of think about these things. Um, I want us to sort of get, move into um, our, our what next work together. And we've been talking about that all night already. I completely acknowledge mm -hmm. that. We've actually been talking about a lot of the solutions here already, a lot of the visions for a better world already. But a specific one, um, I, uh, Tim says, I understand the desire for community-led governance groups. However, I'm not sure what your response to a hateful, violent individual, mm -hmm. such as in Christchurch, looks like what does that response look like when someone like that arrives in your community can you give examples of what a community system might look like and how you'd like to change our police in the short term so i thought i'd pick that up from you awatea and then move to you sonia yeah 
Yeah, I mean, if we look at what did happen, I mean, he did arrive. Um, he had um, support. He definitely felt comfortable to be here because um, he knew, I guess, the status of, he, he could rely on the privilege that white supremacy affords him. And um, that, yeah. yeah. So what do we do? What do we do when these people um, come into our communities in terms of, I think it's talking about transformative justice maybe, and where you have um, panels that um, address um, harms in the community. And so in, in a way, um, a, another way I like to look at it is uh, in terms of um, papu and iwi, that those um, people involved get to determine how that is going to work and what that looks like. So um, I think that's an important part of allowing communities um, to be self-determining. So it's not a one size fits all. So what might work in Remueta for that community isn't right. necessarily going to work in Ruatoria where I'm from. And so we empower and resource and fund these communities to be able to make the, de the decisions that are going to work in their communities. And they are the experts on that. You know, we have a centralized system now that uh, wants to apply a one size fits all. What's happening within that system is what we've been talking about all night is that um, it's not equitable and it is um, preferring some people over others. And so instead of um, trying to tinker around with something that's broken, um, well, I think it's about reinvesting and having that courage to look at new ways of how we can roll out a healing justice and a therapeutic justice where we have lots of options, not just restorative justice, but also transformative justice. In fact, whatever communities decide is going to work best for them. Kia ora, Sonia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I... I, I always find this question an interesting question because it comes up in every conversation I've ever heard about the idea about not having police. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about it is that um, it like it assumes that yeah. that that is what police do is that police are just out here stopping violent terrorists every day. And that's not actually what's happening. The, your, these prisons are not filled with the person who killed in Christchurch. These prisons are filled with Maori bodies in, in Aotearoa. They're filled with black bodies in New Zealand. They're filled with people with low level marijuana charges while whole white people build entire marijuana industries and get rich. They are filled with um, communities and families that needed counseling, that needed rehab, that yeah. needed other resources other than prison. And so when we talk about what to do with those people, I always wonder why we start there. Yeah. If that's not if that's not what policing is actually mostly handling, that's like 0.00001% of what police is happening. What are we doing about the 99.9999999% of what it is that police are doing? And so I just would challenge us to ask again in the space of like a new kind of imagination is to ask new questions. Questions about why, why am I so concerned with this minuscule extreme that I'm willing to forego the entirety of what a community needs so that I can focus on this minuscule extreme. That I think is a fear response in us. And if we move past that fear response, what we actually can do is focus on creating communities that are resilient and powerful. And when you create communities that are resilient and powerful, you lower the likelihood of having the 0.00001% of people who do extreme and violent things like that. Yeah, can I just, I do wanna pick up on this because it touches on something um, that, we've worked on, um, maybe all of us, um, which is prisoner voting. And every time we talk mm. about prisoner voting, someone says, what about the Christchurch terrorist? I do think this question um, about the community policing is a valid one, and I don't want to attack it in, um, in that way, but I do think it sometimes comes up in a bad faith kind of way. Yeah, and you okay. go, actually, our prisons are filled with poor people and brown people. But people can go to prisons for having fines that are unpaid. 
I mean, we're criminalizing entire Poverty. communities in a certain way. Exactly. Um, and, you know, if we know that you're twice as likely to be spoken to by police if you're Māori, and if spoken to by police, you're twice as likely to be arrested, and if arrested, twice as likely to be uh, convicted, and, and then, you know, for the same act um, as another person, twice as likely to go to prison. Yeah. Then we're not, who are we actually banning from voting? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that kind of comes down to that. And the other point, I think, is that the criminal justice system isn't actually there to, to really stop crime. It's a way of determining who did the thing mm -hmm. and then what to do with them. But all of, all of the other things around how to dismantle white supremacy would and could have protected that community. Exactly. Like listening to those communities that were trying to report hate speech on the rise. Online spaces were being left all kind of unregulated as if they don't exist. Um, they, th these, these are the entire communities that have been portrayed as violent terrorists for generations. And I'm in that. You know, and you live over there in the Middle East, you know you're allowed to be shot and killed by American soldiers. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and so dismantling all of that would have protected that community, not the yeah. prison, not the police. Exactly. And and the internal work of white people dismantling white supremacy in them mm -hmm. and white supremacy in their communities yeah. and in their families, the, the um, ways in which um, white people very often aren't even having conversations about their own internalized white supremacy. So, well, yeah. Right, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I've just seen, I have seen an education question that I liked and then it kind of links mm -hmm. for me with another question that's about, you know, the lawyers and the court appointed lawyers are racist and then someone else asking, you know, how can I help in education? And it's sort of like, we actually need to be mainstreamed. Yes. We need to, it needs to be, you know, the education system when I was going through, I read one Patricia Grace short story Mm -hmm. And it was the only author of Māori that should be a crime. <laughs> at all that I read. And so we, you know, where, where are these experiences and, and why aren't kids, you know, and, and, and then why aren't kids getting um, boosted into law school so that we are the judges and the lawyers and that, you know, once our experiences are actually running through those systems, um, including the education system and the healthcare system and the people who design roads and houses and all of that, um, then we might start to not need prisons, eh? Exactly. Woo! We are we're on fire here. Um, <laughs> we've, we've got the bellies, the bellies and the puku are on fire as they blimmin' well should be. I'm going to plea. Uh, we're supposed to be finished, but I'm going to send out a plea uh, to the people watching with us. If you could bear with us for a few minutes, so that we can uh, round this off in a way that justifies. The, the profound take, the profound kopapa that we have brought to the table tonight. Um, what I'm going to suggest is I'll, gi I'll give some sort of roundup comments. I'll hand over to you, Golries, and we'll do we'll do a brief uh, couple minutes each. And then I'd really uh, love for Sonia and then Awatea to have our closing comments. It can be what next, what work is to, to keep going. And then I will bring us all back together and close, off, close us off with um, some, some final housekeeping and a karakia, if that's all okay. Uh, so I'm very quickly gonna rattle off some things, then making some notes on drawing on what we've, what we've discussed tonight. Um, several of us have talked about one of the questions in the chat, which was what can Pākehā do? What can allies do? Um, and I'm drawing off Sonia. Uh, often we talk about, for example, our health system at the moment is so blatantly racist and it's actually killing, it's actually killing Māori, it's killing Pacifica, it's killing um, low-income people as well. There is often talk about doing things like cultural courses, uh, cultural relativity courses. Actually, I, will, I want to suggest what Sonia was saying, look at your own culture, look at your own whiteness is actually where I think a lot of that work can start and have those discussions with your families, friends, networks, as tauriwi, as non-Māori, as a person not of colour and so on and so forth. So I think it's that stuff about rather than learning how to be nice to other cultures, unpick what your own assumptions are in the first off. And then, of course, creating space and making platforms for the voices who are not privileged at this time and have not been for a long, long time. Give up the mic, give up the board, 
Give up the <laughs> give up the positions of power and influence. Give up your article. Give up your weekly magazine writing. Give it over to brown voices, to women, to disabled people, to trans people, to poor people. Give it up. Give the platform over uh, and continue to learn. Uh, and I just want to finish. Thank you, Awati. I want to shout out to the young leaders at Marist College, those young wahine at Marist College standing against systemic racism around the world. You, we have your back. We have your back and we will continue to have your back. Nia, Sherrington, your whanau, your friends, we are here for you. You keep going. You inspire me. You inspire us. Kia kaha. I want to shout out to Ngahi Nahohaya and to all people mo moko kowai, to all our wahine who mo moko kowai, um, and we will stand on that maunga and take our rightful place as wahine, as moko kowai wearers against the racist abuse that you received um, and feel for all of us. And we also have your back, Ehua. Uh, and I want to give a final shout out to everyone who has been working and anti-racism forever, for decades and decades. That's me, Kia ora Gauris. Kia ora, um, I just want to start by um, letting Tim know that we absolutely didn't think your question was um, asked in bad faith. It, it's just it touches on sometimes that that happens, but it, um, and it was a good question. I'm glad that we all answered it um, at length. Um, I just want to hold that we've got a lot more work to do in um, the reforms that we want to bring about in the criminal justice system and in prisons and in the police, even though we want to dismantle some of these institutions, um, I think as as sort of realists right now, it's sort of like I, I want prisoners to have the vote. First and foremost, I know that imprisonment is itself violence and we need to move away from it and we need to find a better system and we need to reimagine our world. But right now, there are men and women um, most of whom have fallen through all of the other cracks in our system where we've failed them, uh, where we've failed to decolonize, where we've failed to dismantle other systems that have kept them from um, accessing their rights, who also now can't vote. Um, I, you know, and so the Green Party has a suite of changes that we want to bring about and that it's kind of about bringing dignity to people coming through the justice system, but also then reimagining our world so that we are looking at, instead of the police, who do we have? Do we have first responders who are mental health experts? Because we know that the armed response team was being sent um, multiple times uh, to suicide call outs. Um, and we know that if they're trigger happy, it's going to be certain communities that pay the price. We know that they were being sent out to domestic um, disturbances, you know, and we, Marama and I sat there um, with the commissioner of police and hashed this out from the beginning. They knew that's what was going to happen. Um, so we do need to move away from having a police force that is the first responder. Um, but right now, we also need to make sure that they can't carry guns. If they're gonna exist, they're not gonna carry guns. If prisons are gonna exist, the conditions are gonna be humane and people are gonna have the dignity of, of their right to vote. The other thing that's really close to my heart is youth justice, and we don't talk about this enough, but New Zealand, one of, one of our biggest breaches in, in human rights altogether is that our um, age of criminal responsibility is 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life is a 13 year old boy sitting behind a giant desk in the Auckland High Court facing a murder charge for throwing a rock off an overbridge. And, and it was horrendous and he, he had caused a loss of life. It was absolutely horrendous. But to, to sit there and be um, charged with sort of being part of a defense team of a child who then you read the background and you know, we all know the SIFS files. We all know where that, that little boy lived, what part mm -hmm. of Auckland. Uh, we know that's where the cops are going. Um, so we do need to reform our system to protect young people as well. And that's something that I'm going to be working on as well next term. Um, but, you know, let's focus not just on the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. So education needs to be inclusive and we need housing and we need jobs and we need to look after nature before we keep pouring money into that justice system that's broken. Sonia. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> 
Um, kia ora. Thank you all so much for, like I said, letting me be a part of this conversation this evening. Um, I feel like my unique lens is about the work of personal transformation, that each of us um, make up the experience that is the world that we live in, and that each of us has the opportunity to do the internal work to create the tools inside of us that will build the world we say we want to live in. And so, um, you know, I think that there are for communities of color, for Maori and Pacifica and um, other immigrant communities that are here, there is the work of, of divesting from the messages that we have come to believe about ourselves under this white supremacist system um, that keep us, um, keep us placating it, keep us um, allowing the status quo, keep us feeling disempowered to challenge that which we know in our souls is wrong and dehumanizing. Um, and so the internal work to undo that voice outside of us that lives inside of us that tells us that somehow all those things that we grew up hearing about ourselves is true. I believe that that's, that healing work is essential for transforming the world. And then for Pakiha, particularly in Aotearoa, it, there it must be a reckoning with the history that is whiteness in Aotearoa that is white supremacist colonial violence in white Aotearoa. The, there must be a reckoning and a realization of how it is that you got here and how it is that you are allowed to be here and to be here in a position of power and privilege over Tonga Te Whenua. And that that comes from looking around your own life and seeing where, where it only looks like you. If all your bookshelves look like Pakiha, if all your workplace looks like Pakiha, if all the places your kids go to school look like Pakiha, if all the restaurants you eat at at Pakiha, then what you are looking at is a white supremacist world that you're living in um, unapologetically and benefiting from. And what does it look like to start doing the work to disrupt that within you and then turning that into action externally to ensure that Maori and Pacifica voices are in those places where they used to only be white that that is that you, it's your assignment to disrupt that dynamic in the places where you have a sphere of influence. I believe that's some of the, the internal work that we can be doing right now. Kia ora, Sonia. Awatea. Yeah, I just want to pick up on, on what you said, Marama, um, partly when we had people who aren't part of the Black, Indigenous, or People of Colour communities, and you have your questions, a kind of what have you done beforehand to try to educate yourself when we talk about the issues uh, that we have tonight they have an emotional toll meanwhile we have our whanau we have our, you know, our wider communities who we're looking at trying to protect and educate at the same time and then you're asking us to do all the heavy lifting and take on all the emotional toil to answer your question. So I just want to pick up with Marama, what Marama said about um, look to uh, the networks that are in your communities. If there are none, start them up and start building them and start connecting to where there are some. Um, rather than relying on uh, BIPOC people to take on that toll for you. Um, and, and I mean that with love. and. Um, so that, uh, and also so that um, people might understand if I make the choice not to respond or not to um, discuss with you what I think you should be doing, um, because I think you should be working out how it is um, you can um, assist in um, the aspirations and the struggles for the BIPOC communities. So, and I just wanna um, pick up on what Golris says. Uh, definitely, in terms of prisoner voting, if we, we need to stop dehuman, dehumanizing people, we need to stop demoralizing people, if we want them to become productive members of our society, okay, that's about making our community safer, then we need to keep their dignity intact, we need to humanize them and provide them with uh, pathways where they can be pro-social. That's why the cannabis law reform is so important. We need to take away um, those barriers that are blocking their future opportunities and their education. And then 
Lastly, on the armed response um, trials, it's, it really took my breath away when on one hand, we're being informed that the trials are being stopped. And then on the other hand, it's like, but hey, what about soft bullets? Now it's really, um, it's really hard to kind of understand where the moral com compass is in that and how they think um, that that is going to help uh, BIPIC communities have any trust in the system when you're constantly looking at ways to harm us and to criminalize us and to take our dignity away and, and dehumanize us. So um, those are things that um, I want to leave with us all to think about in terms of what are we doing you know, to um, further equality, fairness and aroha in our communities um, and how we can have more equitable outcomes because we have a choice and we can do things peacefully now mm. or we can continue to ignore these embedded practices of colonialism, imperialism and then have them erupt within our societies in a way um, that you know, can cause some real harm. So, so yeah. let's look at what we can do now um, together um, so to minimise and reduce the harm that's out there now. Yeah. Ooh, kia ora koutou, kia ora, kia ora Garamin, kia ora Sonia Renee Taylor, kia ora Awatea Mita, tēnā koutou everybody who joined us tonight. I'm still feeling the brain chemistry connections are happening in my brain and my heart and my mind and all of this work will continue and in the meantime I will with Goalries with my colleagues in the Green Party continue to prioritize everybody having a warm safe affordable secure home everybody having a decent livable income that they can live on with some dignity everyone who is able to to be able to have meaningful work that uplifts their lives and enables, enables them to provide for their whanau looking after our rivers and our soil and our trees and our air and our oceans making sure that we have an education system that uplifts who we are making sure we have a health system that delivers the service we need when we need it making sure we've got enough mental health support social workers youth workers making sure we see true te tiriti justice making sure we have connected safe communities that honor each other that honor our differences uh, that is what we will continue to work towards to truly see safe safe communities and thriving whanau so with that uh, thank you all so much for staying with us we went over time we went over time but also there is not enough time that you could ever give to these to this action and to these ported or nor data uh, he karakia whakamutunga. Tūtawa mai i runga, tūtawa mai i raro, tūtawa mai i roto, tūtawa mai i waho. Kia tau wai, te mauri tū, te mauri ora, ki te katoa, haumi e, hui e, taiki e. Come forth from above, come forth from below, come forth from within and from the environment, vitality and well-being for all strengthened in unity. Kia ora rā. Thank you everybody. Kia ora. Kia ora. Beautiful. Kia ora. Thank you everyone. <laughs>